if you have been around Horse Cave Baptist Church very much, you know that we emphasize the gospel, whichever church should emphasize the gospel. And the last several years, I've been using an outline that gives us a picture of what the gospel is. I call it the seven movements of the gospel. And also gives you an outline for the entire Bible. Now we know the gospel, the heart of the gospel, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. If those things didn't happen, pack it up, shut off the lights, it's done. There's no reason for us to meet because Christianity is a lie. But we know Christianity is the truth. But there's some things that happen before the death, burial, and resurrection, and there are some things that happen afterwards that really help explain the gospel. I explain it this way. God created us, Genesis 1 and 2. Sin corrupted us, Genesis 3. Christ came for us, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We can come to Christ. The book of Romans spells that out. The Holy Spirit is changing us. Jesus said in John chapter 14, 15, 16, Acts 1, 8, that there are six things the Holy Spirit will be doing in our lives until we see Jesus again. We can help change others through the church. When you understand the purposes of the church, it's designed to help change the lives of other people. And then the last movement of the gospel is that Jesus is coming for us. Now that's what I want to focus on just a minute. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is focusing His attention on the day that He will come and get us. Why is it important to know that? I mean, why is it important for that to be a part of of the gospel message itself. In Acts chapter 1 verses 9 through 11 we read about the fact that Jesus ascended into heaven and one day he's coming back. Verse 9. After he said this he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So again, why is it important to realize that one day Jesus is coming for us when you include that in the gospel message? Now there may be several reasons, but a couple come to mind. First thing is this, history in my life is not just going in circles. Repeat, wash and repeat, wash and rinse and repeat. No, it's not going in circles, it's going somewhere. It's going to someone. One day Jesus is coming back. I think another reason why it's important to talk about the second coming of Jesus in the gospel presentation itself is that there is accountability for the gospel message. If you ignore it, you ignore it at your peril, because one day all of this is going to end. So I have a few ideas and thoughts about the part of the gospel meaning that Jesus is coming for us. So here's some questions I have. What is Jesus doing in heaven right now until he comes? Here's a few things. In John 14, 1 through 4, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. So he's preparing a place for us in heaven. Colossians 3.1, it says that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. That's the place of authority. You see, from this place of authority, Jesus is ruling heaven and earth. He administers his kingdom work. And he's presiding over the world as judge. Acts chapter 7, verse 55 and 56 says that Jesus is standing at the right hand of God, welcoming His children home. This is the section where Stephen has been sharing the gospel with the Sanhedrin, with the religious leaders. They're about to stone Him to death because they say He's blaspheming, saying that Jesus is God. And then Stephen makes that now very famous statement when he says, Look, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He was standing, not sitting but welcoming his child home, Stephen. It's a beautiful picture. John 1, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Jesus is speaking to the Father on our behalf, in our defense. When we sin and we repent, 
and we get forgiveness from Him. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 13 through 16 says that we have a high priest who sympathizes with us. He knows what it's like being human. And as He intercedes for us, He understands us. Again, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23 through 26, it says that Jesus is interceding to the Father on our behalf. That's what He's doing right now in heaven. Here's another question that comes to mind. What is Jesus waiting on so He can return? The angel said He's coming back just like He left. So what's He waiting on? Matthew 24, 14 says when the gospel has reached all the nations in the world. Now imagine this just a moment. There is one last person that needs to hear the gospel before Jesus comes back. Who is that person? Where is that person? This is why we send missionaries to all the people groups of the world because not until every nation and every people group have heard about Jesus will Jesus come back. Matthew 24, 36 through 44. It says, Jesus will come back when the Father says go because only the Father knows the timing that Jesus will come again. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. The Bible says that Jesus will return when the man of lawlessness shall appear. And many believe that is the Antichrist. So that's just a few of the reasons why he is waiting on his return. Here's another thought. Why is Jesus coming back? Now seriously, why is he coming back? 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 through 18. He is coming back with all of his followers who've already passed away so that he can gather all of the followers that are still alive together as his people. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 8 through 12. Jesus is coming back to overcome the man of lawlessness and to judge all those who have followed the man of lawlessness in rebellion against the Father. 2 Peter 3, verses 10 through 13. Jesus is coming back to destroy the heavens and the earth with fire and then to bring about a new heaven and a new earth. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. To judge his followers. If you had watched our last 15-minute Bible study, we looked at that passage about what happens when a believer dies. Well, one of these days, Jesus will judge all those who've accepted Him as Savior. Again, not to determine whether they go to heaven or hell. They're going to heaven. We are going to heaven. That's determined on this earth. But what He's going to do is basically, I think, ask a question. What did you do with what I gave you? we all been given gifts. We've all been given abilities. We've all been given opportunities. He'll want to know, what did you do with what I gave you? And we need to pass that test. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, Scripture says that Jesus will judge the nations. That's a passage where He puts the sheep on one side, those who minister to people, and the goats on the other side, those who didn't minister to people. And He said, if you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. Or if you did not do it to the least of these, you didn't do it to me. I think that's closely aligned with Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, the great white throne judgment, where those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life will experience what the Bible calls the second death. They'll be cast into the lake of fire. That's where I like that phrase. It's one way, really, of explaining the gospel. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. If you're only born physically, then you will die physically, and then you will die in the second death. But if you've been born twice, physically born and spiritually born again, you just die once. Here's the last question that comes to mind. What are we to be doing until Jesus returns. I mean, He gave us work to do, so I looked at a few. Just think of these. What am I to do until Jesus comes back? 2 Peter 3, 8-13 through I am to be faithful and to live like He taught me. I am to be faithful to Him and live the way He taught. Matthew 25, 1-13 through 
I am to be ready at a moment's notice because Jesus could come back right now. You don't wait to do what He leads you to do. You don't wait to reach out to people. You do that as the time and opportunity brings itself because Jesus is coming again. And we don't know the time and we don't know the hour. But we need to be ready no matter what. And then Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we know it is the Great Commission. We need to be a witness. We need to reach out in love. And then we need to teach others to obey everything that Jesus taught us. Now I know that's not an extensive list. I know there's more that I could list. But I think about the fact in the Gospel that Jesus is coming back. Remember the heart of the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but there are some things that happen before that that you need to understand, and there are some things that happen after that that we need to understand. And the second coming of Jesus, the fact He's coming for us, I think is a very important part of the gospel presentation because it teaches accountability and preparation. The first book we think that the Apostle Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, wrote was 1 Thessalonians. Paul had been in Thessalonica for just three weeks, and then he got run out of town. That seems to be a common occurrence for Paul. But as he's writing 1 Thessalonians, he writes extensively about the second coming of Jesus. Now think about this. Paul just had three weeks with that church. But in those three weeks, he already told them about the fact that Jesus is coming for us. Let's not leave that out of our gospel presentations. And let's not leave that truth out of our daily lives. Something to think about. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you're not going to leave us alone. And I thank you that you're going to send your son back for us. Help us as we share the gospel with people that as opportunity presents itself, that we may tell them the fact that you're coming back and that we need to be ready. Thank you for showing us how. In Jesus' name, amen.